Thank you. So again, dear friends, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are going to begin now um, with interfaith prayer. I'm going to ask please that Rabbi Gilad share the first prayer, followed by Pundit Suresh. Um, so that's a friend from the Jewish faith and a friend from the Hindu faith. And then Tahare Mati from the Baha'i faith. And then I, I know I'm putting dear Nita on the spot, but Nita shares beautifully. So if I could ask Nita also please to, to share a prayer from the Brahma Kumaris. Um, um, Gilad, over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to, uh, to be here. Thank you for uh, allowing us and to join in this prayer together. Interfaith prayer is so important and the more we unite, three times a day in our meditation prayer which is called Amida and it's a it's a paragraph about gratitude and I'll read it in the Hebrew for those that wish to benefit from it and translate it as well for you we say like this על חיינו בסמי ידיך, ועל נשפותנו פה גדול לך, ועל ניסיך שבכל יום עימנו, ועל נפלותיך, וטוב בתיך שבכל עת ערב בבוקר בצהריים, הטוב כי לא אוכל לרחמך, ואמרכם כי לא תמו חסדיך, ואלם כיווינו לך. In the English, so we can all benefit from the beautiful words. We gratefully thank you, for it is you are our gods, and the God of our fathers, for all eternity, rock of our lives, Shirt of our salvation, are you from generation to generation? We thank you and relate your praise for our lives, which are committed to your power, for our souls that are entrusted to you, your miracles that are with us every day, and your wonders and favors in every season, even in morning and afternoon. The beneficent one, for your compassions whenever exhausted, and the compassionate one. Your kindness never ended. Always uh, we put our hope in you. And just to just to add that this evening we begin the Jewish festival of Hanukkah, which is a festival of, uh, of miracles and really our festival of lights. So I know some of our friends uh, celebrated Diwali recently, and now we're going into our festival of lights uh, at this evening. I wish you all a good day and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Dear, dear Pundit Suresh, we, we can't hear you. Um, you're on mute. Can you please start again? Thank you so much. Namaste. Am I audible now? Namaste. Am I audible now? Yes. Am I audible now? Am I audible now? 
Yes. Uh, Pandit Suresh Singh, KZN. KZN. Phoenix representing the Hindu community. The Hindu community. Uh, I will do a short prayer uh, and a small explanation. And a small explanation. Om Hari Om Tatsat Hari Om Tatsat Hari Om Tatsat Om Vishnu 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 Om Guru Re Brahma Guru Re Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwara Guru Re Sakshate Param Brahma Tasme Shri Guru Vev Namaha Tasme Shri Guru Vev Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manavisam Stapita Minabhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamadyam Dadati Savapadantikam Vande Aham Shiri Guru Shiri Yutapadam Kamalam Shiri Guru Vaishnavam Sacha Shirupam Sahagrahajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tam Sajiva Sarvitam Sadhuhutam Parijana Shaitam Krishna Chaitanya Dam Diva Shirada Krishna Padan Jagana Lalita Shivishaka Vitam Cha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dhina Bandhu Jagatpati Gopisa Gopika Rekanta Radha Kanta Namastute Kapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindava Nishwari Krishna Bano Stuti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vincha Kalpata Biascha Creepers in the Bay Avacha Patita Anamapavana Bhaya Vishnava Pu Namu Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vidanta Swami Iti Namani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharani Nirvi Shesha Shunyavadi Pasya Dedisatarani Shashri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shirvatari Gedara Shivasa the Guru Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari 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 Krishna Hari Krishna 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 Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari Om Dhyo Shanti Antarikshva Gam Shanti Prithavi Shanti Hirapa Shanti Osha Deva Shanti Vanaspatya Shanti Vishwa Deva Shanti Hi Brahma Shanti Sarvagam Shanti Shanti Reva Shanti Sama Shanti Redi Om Shanti 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 Om Hari Om Tatsat Hari Om Tatsat Hari Om Tatsat Om Vishnu 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 Om Hare Krishna Jai Shri Ram Prem Namaste one more time uh, Warm greetings and love from the Hindu community in this world that we are living today that we are faced with many many challenges and one cannot find peace within oneself the only way one will be able to find peace within himself if there is righteousness in the heart is got to start off in the heart when there is righteousness in the heart then there is beauty in the character when there's beauty in the character then there's humble in the home when there's humble in the home then there's order in the nation when there is order in the nation, then they become peace in the world. So we are looking for the peace that starts within us and within our heart. And from there, then you'll find peace in the world. And you will find that we pray to the Lord who is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient that you are the supreme personality of God. That everything revolves around you. You know the past, you know the present, you know the future. So we pray to you that you let peace come for all living entities, 8,400,000 species of life that is in this universe. So let there be peace in the universe, let there be peace on earth, let there be peace in all living entities. In, in this way, when there's peace in all living entities, then, then all, everyone becomes happy and glorified. Thank you. Hare Krishna. I'm done. Thank you. This is a revealed prayer from the Baha'i writings for humanity. O thou kind Lord, thou hast created all humanity from the same stock. Thou hast decreed that all shall belong to the same household. In thy holy presence, they are all thy servants and all mankind are sheltered beneath thy tabernacle. All have gathered together at thy table of bounty. All are illumined through the light of thy providence. 
O oh God, thou art kind to all, thou hast provided for all, dost shelter all, conferdest life upon all. Thou hast endowed each and all with talents and faculties, and all are emerged in the ocean of thy mercy. O oh, thou kind Lord, unite all. Let the religions agree and make the nations one, so that they may see each other as one family and the whole earth as one home. May they all live together in perfect harmony. O oh God, raise aloft the banner of the oneness of mankind. O oh God, establish the most great peace. Cement thou, O oh God, the hearts together. O oh, thou kind Father God, gladden our hearts through the fragrance of thy love. Brighten our eyes through the light of thy guidance. Delight our ears with the melody of thy word and shelter us all in the stronghold of thy providence. Thou art the mighty and powerful. Thou art the forgiving, and thou art the one who overlooketh the shortcomings of all mankind. Abdul Baha. Thank you. I'd like to invite you into a quiet reflection. So just for a moment, let's just leave all the outside world outside. And just quietly turn inwards. I find that quiet space within that holds my purest intentions and where I can return to that place of peace within. As my mind becomes still and quiet and I allow my heart to open to the presence of the divine. I hold this moment and in this beautiful connection, I allow God's energy to empower me, to support me and to hold me. And I recognize in this moment that I can be a channel and instrument for his peace, his love, his compassion. And so let me in this quietness within my mind and my heart, just invite the presence of the divine and allow him to guide the proceedings today. Allow his mercy and benevolence to touch every single being as I hold this beautiful connection with God, my father, my mother. So I take a moment to just hold this peace and love and allow it to radiate outwards into the world. Om Shanti. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dianita. That was lovely. And thank you to all of those who've prayed with us this morning. We will have a few other prayers at the end um, by Mama Grace Hudu and Sister Kathy. But for now, we're going to begin. We are very blessed um, today to have some incredible speakers with us. And I'm going to change the order a little bit because Dr. Iraj Abedian has another appointment at 10 o'clock. So we're very lucky that he was able to um, get uh, some time with us as well this morning. But before I introduce him and invite him up, I just would like to share something with all of you. Um, like I said earlier, the um, 
Religions for Peace South Africa has been in existence for 25 years and Religions for Peace International is 50 years old this year. And I just wanted to share um, the history very briefly. So during apartheid, the, um, the religious leaders of South Africa knew that spiritual strength was needed to help remove the oppression of the apartheid system and help move the country into freedom. And so religious leaders from throughout South Africa joined together in unity and they decided to help the process of um, reconciliation and moving into freedom. So they were, the Religions for Peace South Africa was led by Desmond Tutu and some other very instru instrumental, huge, huge souls in this country. And they were quite instrumental also in helping with the peace and reconciliation trials, which I thought I would mention because Reconciliation Day is coming up shortly. So I'd, list, I'd like to just share with you um, what are the goals of Religions for Peace? And if you look here, they're, they're quite straightforward and simple. We work for peaceful, just, and inclusive societies, gender equality, the protection and the education of how to protect the environment. Uh, we promote the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, interreligious education and dialogue like we're having today, and building global partnerships with like-minded organizations and individuals who also want to see people of faith learn to come together in unity to serve and understand one another. So with that, I would like to now invite um, Dr. Raj. I'm just going to share a little bit about him before, and I'll try not to embarrass him too much. Um, Dr. Iraj Avedian is um, a dear friend of mine, families, and he is originally from Iran, where he has experienced a lot of religious persecution himself and came to South Africa as a young man to start a new life. He is a professor of economics at UCT, or he was until 2000. He's the founder and executive chair of Pan-African Capital Holdings. He was a member of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of South Africa from 2009 to 2014. And he's an avid promoter of human rights, ethics, and religious values. He's also an author on public policy, and he helps with addressing the issues of corruption and working for just societies. And he is just a lover of humanity in all its diversity. So with that, I just would like to invite Dr. Iraj Abedian to share with us about uh, faith in times of crisis. Over to you, Dr. Abedian. Um, thank you very much, Ailey, and uh, greetings to all and every uh, of you. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you today and have the opportunity to share some ideas on this very important issue of faith in life's crisis. Um, I have uh, drawn much of my inspiration from what I'm going to share with you from the Baha'i writings. However, these are not Baha'i views, these are my personal views. Um, and therefore, uh, I like to reflect on some of the key elements of faith in our life, whatever our religious belief, whatever our spiritual paradigm, uh, we find that uh, faith uh, plays a very critical role at two levels for us human beings, at a personal level and at a social or communal level. At a personal level, faith, our belief, provides emotional and psychological assurance and comfort, especially in times of stress, crisis, and vulnerability. Our immediate reaction is to revert back to our belief, to our spiritual paradigm, to the framework that gives us protection. In a way, it creates an inner stability where nobody else can do, not even our dearest and closest uh, family. That inner stability is inextricably linked to our spiritual being. That is where it is the ultimate haven for our soul as associated with our body, with our material life. So wherever we go through ordeals, wherever we end up in a fearful conditions in life, our immediate reaction, our immediate built-in default mode is to go back to our faith. 
at a community level or at a communal or social level, faith also plays a major, almost irreplaceable function in our life, in our social organizations. If we look around ourselves throughout history as well as now, and it will be the case as we evolve as human beings, we find that faith becomes a major source of empathy, philanthropy, care, and collective mo uh, mobilization in, in times of uh, vulnerability, in times of hopelessness, in fight against injustice. Um, Haley mentioned that uh, in South Africa, we've had a history, almost 100 years of history, um, ever since social mobilization against the injustices of racial prejudice and the state organized uh, discrimination uh, we have recorded, we have seen that right through faith, all faith have been central to this social mobilization. So somehow when it comes to communal and social activities, we use faith, we use our spiritual anchor to mobilize sentiments, emotions, and um, uh, grouping of human beings, if you like, collective action in pursuit of social justice and fairness. These two elements of faith in life are interrelated. Our inner social, our inner spiritual uh, construct and our outer social organizations are driven by faith, anchored in a spirituality, and driven, mobilized through our connectivity as human beings, irrespective of race and religious belief, nationality and tribal association. Whenever we want to create a common platform, we go back to spiritual values. And in fact, if we deep if we examine deeply, all our religious and spiritual belief systems have much in common in promoting sympathy, care, love, and respect for human soul, for human life. So as we enter into moments of crisis, as we have done as human beings, we find that crisis in itself or in themselves create an interesting opportunity for us individually and collectively to up our game, to become more spiritual. We thought we were caring before, now we need to become more caring. So crisis uh, in a way create an opportunity for becoming more humane, more linked to our spirit, to our faith. There is a Chinese proverb that says, the gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a man perfected without trials. This theme runs through many holy books where our messengers of God, where our holy texts remind us that trials and difficulties are much like the polish that brushes the rough gem within ourselves, each one of us. It polishes that stone that under the pressure of trials and crises, provided we remain faithful to our spiritual values, it ultimately turns us into a bright, shining, valuable, precious jewel. So faith operates that way and crisis activates, challenges us to get back to our faith, to polish the gem, the roughest stone within ourselves. At the same time, crisis does a similar type of role in a group or in a communal life. It challenges us to connect with other human beings. It challenges us or provides us an opportunity to reach out across boundaries, boundaries of race, boundaries of religious uh, titles, boundaries of nations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have, over the past year or so, experienced globally under the duress of COVID-19 pandemic, a crisis that has 
at the same time that has caused much havoc, trauma, and destruction to socioeconomic life, it has also created a fantastic opportunity for humanity across boundaries, across borders, across all kinds of divisions to reach out to each other, to empathize, not just sympathize, to empathize with each other's fears. I don't have to be in China or in Japan, in UK or in Mexico to see how they feel, our fellow human beings. So that in itself has become, for the first time in human history, a crisis that we have had crises, many crises before, many pandemics before, but never ever before have we had a crisis, a pandemic that has brought nearly all human beings under the same kind of empathetic spiritual paradigm, that they have a choice, that we all have a choice. We have a choice of empathizing and using the crisis as a source of further division, or we use the, exactly the same conditions, the same crisis, the same pa COVID pandemic crisis as a platform for unification. So far, we have had both. If we look around ourselves, we see that the crisis has challenged many people's faith and they have gone towards what they call it normal, which I submit is not normal at all. I often hear people talking about, when are we going to get back to normal? I suggest we should stop using the term normal. These people who ask these questions, they want to go back to the familiar. Familiar is very different from normal. The normality that they want to go back, if we look back, was full of all kinds of dis discrimination, misogyny, economic inequality, suppression, oppression, and all kinds of, of divisive um, borders and attributes. Surely, surely, we cannot want to yearn, go back to that normal. Yes, I understand some want to go to the familiar because they were comfortable, they were benefiting from it. But our faith suggests that this crisis is an opportunity not to want to go back to that normal, which I suggest it was only familiar. Rather, we should use this opportunity to reach out to each other, to unite on our faith and our spiritual principles in order to create a normal which is more humane, maybe unfamiliar, but it will be far more spiritual a condition, a social order, a spiritual order, a human order that would be using the crisis and lessons of crisis as a catalyst, as a key to unlocking the closed boxes of care, love, unity of humankind, the elimination of all kinds of divisions and borders that we were so familiar with. No matter where we come from, no matter what racial, economic, cultural, or social background we have, if we look back honestly, we will see that we are familiar with all those divisive elements. And the crisis of COVID-19 has forced us individually and collectively to look at those pictures and say, do we really like that? Do we really want to go back to that? And if not, ask a very simple question which we may not be able to answer it very quickly, but that question is very simple, but profound. How do we move from where we are collectively to where we would like to be? Even if you're beginning to tread very, very unfamiliar paths, it's not familiar, but it's exciting, it's inspiring, it's compatible with our spiritual values, with our inner soul, which is the source of our inspiration. So, in my humble view, the crisis that we have is a fantastic platform, a unique platform, that we abandon the familiar, brave the untrodden path, and use the crisis that engulfs humanity for a victory over all those borders of prejudice and discrimination in humane practices and the suffering that the majority, a great majority of our fellow human beings um, experience on a daily basis. We do not go back to that familiar, we want to get away from that and create a new dispensation. The major unshakable driver 
the fuel for this long journey is nothing but faith. Faith which has been, is, and will continue to be the unshakable platform for our progress individually and collectively. I thank you for the opportunity and I most uh, uh, profusely apologize that I have another commitment at 10 o'clock, which um, I will continue being with you until then. Wish you all the very best and thank you again for the opportunity that I've been given. God bless. Thank you, dear Dr. Iraj, very, very much uh, for reminding us that we are all like gems that need to be polished and that this is an opportunity for further polishing and creating a more spiritual environment as a way forward rather than going back to the new normal. Such profound thoughts to consider. And I'm glad you gave us the challenge to talk about that a little bit, you know, what is it that we can do to build this new opportunity into something better. So after the speakers, there'll be a bit of time for discussion on exactly that. So thank you so much. Um, we're going on to our next speaker now. And dear friends, I'm very, very excited to in introduce uh, dear Reverend Tandi Nflengetwa. Uh, she is a pioneer of the New Thought Movement in South Africa. She's an ordained unity minister, the first one in South Africa. She's a member of the Association of Global New Thought, Agape Worldwide Spiritual Communities and Unity International Council, and the founder of Unity Worldwide Ministries for the Africa region. She's an international speaker. She's the founder of the Unity Center of Love and Light, and she is a convener of the season for nonviolence and also a facilitator for the Nelson Mandela Foundation and a, a true advocate for social justice, peace, and the African spirituality of Ubuntu. I'm very, very pleased to warmly welcome this dear sister to now address us. Over to you, Reverend. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Haley, uh, for that uh, beautiful introduction and welcome. San Bonani. Dumelang, good morning, Luchang. It is an honor for me to, to participate in this National Interfaith Prayers and the Bishop Desmond Dutu Peace Lecture. I would first like to thank Religions for Peace South Africa in giving the interfaith community an opportunity to dialogue and to reflect on the role of faith during these times of crisis. Our nation has had many instances of crisis, from colonialism to the oppressive apartheid regime and to many other forms of massacres and violence. The Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu played a significant role, as Haley has mentioned, during the times of advocating sanctions against South Africa, particularly in the 80s and 70s. Even though he was criticized by many for advocating sanctions, he held on to the faith that eventually South Africa would become a free, non-racial, open, democratic society. And through the process of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Arch inspired the upholding of the spirit of Ubuntu as a premise on which we build our new democratic society. And our constitution itself, transformative constitutionalism is based on the spirit of Ubuntu. Today, we are facing a different types of crisis in the form of this COVID-19 pandemic, racism, and gender-based violence. In my talk today, I would like to draw from the inspiration of the 23rd Psalm, verse three, from the Bible. And I draw four symbolisms from this inspiration as a process of upholding faith as we move 
through these times of crisis. And it reads, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because thou art with me. I want to begin with the phrase, the shadow of death. The shadow of death represents the COVID-19 pandemic and the gender-based violence and all the devastations that these pandemics are leaving behind. Every day, we are literally and figuratively experiencing the casting of the shadow of death through the unprecedented loss of lives. I cannot count the thousands that have already lost lives during this pandemics. The loss of jobs, the loss of livelihoods, and the loss of our lives as we know it. Now with the loss of lives and loss of livelihoods comes grief in various forms. Grief at both the individual and the collective level. And grief is also being experienced by us as we are being faced by our own mortality every day. We need to acknowledge our grief individually and collectively. And as spiritual communities, we need to find ways of supporting one another and our communities through navigating the grief period. Because it is in the grief itself that we find healing. And the next phrase is walking through the valley. The valley are the inevitable consequences of COVID-19 that the pandemic is leaving behind. The lockdown period can be compared to the, to the valley. The devastating impact on our economy and our lives can be compared to the valley. But let us draw the courage through the truth that we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Now walking through implies that this is not a permanent state of affairs. Walking through implies that there will be a breakthrough. With our faith, we see the light. With our faith, we are walking through. We recognize that we are not staying in the valley. We are not resigning ourselves to the valley and the sorrow and the devastation. But by the same token, we are not flying over the valley. We are feeling the pain. We are learning the lessons as we are walking through the valley. Now, walking through is in the present continuous tense. It is in the present continuous tense. Now, what does this mean? This calls for a moment by moment, a step by step, everyday recognition that we are getting through this collectively and together. We are getting through this much stronger than we have been before because we have walked through what has never happened before. We are walking through it individually and collectively. 
Now, walking through also entails breaking through into higher levels of consciousness. Instead of sinking in the valley, we are breaking through new portals of being. As we are holding the faith, as we are walking through these challenging times, these are the times where we need to summon our inner strength and our inner resourcefulness. We need to realize that we are interconnected, interdependent, and interrelated. And that every choice that we make in this crisis affects only not ourselves, but all of us. We need to ask ourselves, how are we being? Because you see, we are human beings before we are human doings. So we are human beings, we are not doings. So how are we being as humans as we walk through? The way we are being is just as important as our doing during these times. Now, as the religious interfaith community, we need to continue showing up showing up in truth as we are having conversation today. We need to continue offering spiritual support in our communities. We need to continue being the light in our communities, giving encouragement and hope during these times. And the next phrase is, I will not be afraid. So even as I am walking through, I will not be afraid. And what is the message that this phrase holds for us as we are walking through the pandemics? Fear, anxiety, and panic are some of the natural human reactions that we go through in a crisis. When we focus our attention completely on the bad news and the fear, it is easy to be overstressed, to feel immobilized, and to be overwhelmed by fear. Holding on to faith entails that whilst we stay informed, we do not become overwhelmed by fear and anxiety. Faith is the opposite of fear. It is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We are hoping to get through this pandemic as wiser, more resilient, more compassionate human beings. Now, exercising our faith means, irrespective of our fears, we demonstrate our courage by fulfilling our roles as spiritual leaders in our homes, in our communities, and in our country. We take the responsibility to educate and inform ourselves and others on how to navigate these trying times. The fourth spiritual import of this phrase is, for thou art with me. Now, in every religion, in every faith, there is an acknowledgement of a greater power. This power and this presence 
is called by different names in different religions and in different cultures. But the essence of it is one. For thou art with me recognizes the infinite loving presence of God that is always with us, even as we go through these crises. Now this presence is omnipotence and omniscience. It is the love intelligence that governs the universe. It is the love intelligence that grounds our faith. What connects us is much more significant, much more important, and much more life affirming than what that differentiates us. An example is the life-giving energy of the sun, which shines upon all of us. If there should be just one day without the sun, we would all perish. If there could be just one day without air, or even only for 10 minutes, we would all perish. And so we ground ourselves, we ground our faith on this eternal loving presence of God, which is expressing in, as, and through each one of us, irrespective of race, color, gender, where we were born. And it is in this present that will never leave nor forsake us. And it is in this presence where we recognize our oneness with the divine, we recognize our oneness with the eternal. And through faith, we are inspired and uplifted to higher levels of consciousness. And having said that with the four phrases from the 23rd Psalm, I would like to look into how are we creating new models and new ways of thinking. I would like to quote from Beckman Stafula, Beckman Stafula, and I quote, you never change things by fighting the, ex the existing reality, but you change something by building a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Having walked through and broken through the pandemic, we need to learn the lessons that the crisis is teaching us. Now, the first lesson is that through the crisis, we can create new models, new models of thinking, new models of being. The new way of thinking calls for a fundamental shift in consciousness. It calls for a deep awareness of reverence of the oneness of all life. It calls for a fusion of our passion for God with the compassion for humanity. And how do we create the new models? You know, I am reminded of the movie, The Titanic. While all the passengers were in this one colossal Titanic ship, when the ship, were, they are all in this one Titanic ship. They were in different uh, level, they were in different decks. And then when the ship was beginning to sink, the masses of people in the lower deck started seeing and feeling the water flooding the ship. But the people at the upper decks, you know, the third and the fifth decks, were completely unaware and completely oblivious of what was going on at the lower decks. Now, the, 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 the people at the, at the, lower, at the lower deck started, uh, started giving out the lifeboats and trying to, to save themselves. Now, the passengers in the upper decks were concerned with trivialities. Like, for instance, you know, not having enough cream in their coffee and what to eat the next meal when they became aware that the ship was sinking it was too late so we need to be aware 
We need to be sensitive of the glaring socioeconomic challenges of the masses of our people. We need to be acutely aware of social distances, of social injustices. We need to be acutely aware and sensitive and responsive to how our, our communities are being affected by the pandemic. Otherwise, we become like those passengers in the Titanic who became aware of the sinking of the ship when it was too late. Systems and cultures are manifest forms of our own collective thinking and beliefs. We need to truly embrace the spirit of Ubuntu, not only as a philosophy that we like to quote when it suits us, but as a way of life where we truly know and where we truly live the maxim that I am because you are. Umuntu, umuntu ngabantu. Thank you all. May God bless our beautiful country, South Africa, and all her children. Ashe. Gyabonga, Mama. That was so beautiful. Thank you for Thank telling you. us again in story you do so well with telling through story to help teach us lessons so through our grief we find healing walking through this difficult time means that we're walking through and we will get through it so thank you for reminding of us that of that to us as well and before i introduce our next speaker i wanted to ask um sheikh salim has joined us um, Sheikh Salim, would you like to offer us a prayer along the lines of helping us through these um, difficulties that we're going through? Uh, Sheikh Salim? Okay, I think maybe he's um, not hearing me yet, so it's fine. We're going to go on to our next speaker. I'm very, very excited to announce um is is bishop mike foster he is a methodist minister he's the director of the ecumenical affairs for the methodist church of South, southern africa he's the executive member of uh, he is an executive member of the kzn, KZN interreligious council council a south african christian council member and a longtime member of religions for peace south africa he is an advocate for rights of women and children, and he is a very, very dear, kind-hearted soul who we've all grown to love very much over the years of our interfaith work together. I'd like to hand over to you, dear Bishop Mike, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you for this opportunity and uh, thank you so much, Haley, for all your hard work in uh, putting this together for us. Um, it's highly appreciated and uh, it certainly is an honor to be speaking um, after the two previous speakers who in many ways, I think we could have just ended with them and I think we have enough uh, food to, to reflect on. However, I'll, uh, I just want to share a few thoughts on this topic of faith in a time of crisis. I firstly want to quote uh, the late great Chief Albert Lutuli, who said that you can only find freedom through the cross. And that was said at a time of, of heightened oppression, a heightened crisis of discrimination, and, uh, and a heightened crisis of people dying daily through the repressive apartheid regime. And what he was basically saying there is that even in the greatest time of crisis, um, you can, can lead one to freedom. And that the cross, as we know, is a, is a prominent symbol within Christianity. And in, in Roman times, of course, it was a symbol of torture um, and a reminder to everybody that if you, if you uh, fail to obey the, uh, the, the Roman uh, way, 
then you would face the cross of torture, as it were. And uh, Chief Albert Latuli was reminding us that, that even when we go through great times of crisis, that we can still attain freedom, uh, depending on our response to that. And then I want to quote uh, two other um, authors, uh, two Jewish authors in particular. Uh, the one is a favorite one of mine, um, uh, Dr. Viktor Frankl, who, as we know, was a psychiatrist and he lived through the horrible times of Auschwitz. And um, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, um, he asked the question, why is it that some of the, his compatriots survived and others did not? And he then, I think, quoted what, my, what I think is a Buddhist, um, I think it originated in Buddhism, but he basically said, to live is to suffer, to survive is to find meaning in the suffering. And I think that that is very pertinent, that in a time of crisis, that often the thing that keeps us going is the meaning that we find in that, the hope that we've already, that some of our speakers have already uh, mentioned that keeps us going. And um, then the, the, the third uh, person I want to quote comes from the, the joint book, which was written by the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu called the, the Book of Joy. And I'd like to quote the, the author, Douglas Abrams, who himself is also a Jewish, and who himself um, in the book speaks of his own battle with depression. And he says the following, he says, if your health is strong, when viruses come, they will make you feel sick. If your overall health is weak, even small viruses will be dangerous for you. Similarly, if your mental health is sound, then when disturbances come, you will have some distress, but, re but quickly recover. If your mental health is not good, then small disturbances, small problems will cause much pain and suffering. And he goes on to say, you will have much fear and worry, much sadness and despair, and much anger and aggravation. And so he concludes. And what he's pointing to here is that pretty much that if he's talking about mental health and we, we talk about our faith as enabling good mental health, that even through the, the toughest times, that if our mental health and our faith is strong, we'll be able to get through it. It doesn't mean in as much as both uh, Albert Lutuli and also um, uh, Viktor Frankl were implying is that it doesn't take away the, the, the suffering. It doesn't take away the cross, as it were. But it's our attitude and our, our, the way we, 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 we approach both the crisis and these times of, of despair, as it were, that will get through us. And, and in many ways, those of us who are people of faith and of hope, we believe that that is what will, will get us through. One of the interesting things is that um, the, the term fear not occurs more than about 400 times in both the Hebrew scriptures, what we as Christians call the Old Testament, and also the New Testament. It occurs many, many, many times throughout the scriptures. Fear not, fear not, and uh, do not be afraid, because it's constantly addressing the basic human condition that when we fear, we begin to, to become paralyzed and we be, begin to become despondent. And so the best way to overcome that is to have faith in God. And God encourages us to fear not, do not fear. And as Reverend Tandi alluded to in the Psalm 23, that even when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, we need not fear. And that's a, that's a constant theme throughout the scriptures. And so today we, we, we come to our, what is in, in, in effect about the, the sixth, pandemic that has come to our shores in, uh, in South Africa in particular. Uh, the pandemics began in about uh, 1713 uh, with, the, with smallpox, which decimated uh, many of the population. Um, it was then followed by the, 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 the plague, the so-called bubonic plague. And uh, it was then uh, followed by the Spanish flu and by polio. And then also we still have with us the, the pandemic of HIV and AIDS, which we 
we still are dealing with day to day. And of course, COVID-19 has also uh, come our way. So it's another pandemic. And it's interesting that when you read something of the history and responses of both the faith community and the, the scientists and everybody to each pandemic, they're not dissimilar to the way we have approached them today. Because you will find that the faith community often uh, goes into a place of fear or begins to, especially within the, uh, 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 the, the Abrianic faiths and more specifically Christianity, they tend to go into a place of trying to say it's the end of times and that that's a, that's a bad thing. And they, instead of preaching good news, uh, their messages end up being bad news to everybody, as it were. So there are different faith responses to, to times of crisis. But I think I want to bring us back to what I believe is the central proposition of the scriptures, certainly the scriptures I believe in and what Jesus taught. And the central proposition is simply God is love. And the and then there's another wonderful verse within the scriptures that says, perfect love casts out fear. And as we unpack the idea of God is love, this is, this is love for God, love for self, love for one's neighbor, and love for the environment and nature. And I think sometimes we, we, we forget about the, the first one, about the, the, the love for God and the love for self. Because when you, you know that you are loved, then there is few things that can overcome you when you know that you're loved. Um, and we find that that is often a, a huge problem amongst young people. One of the greatest killers amongst young people is the second greatest killer amongst young people is suicide. And when you unpack why that is, it's because many of them don't feel that they are loved. And I think so, so knowing that you are loved, is not just a case of saying or believing that you're loved, but it's actually knowing that you are loved and that more especially if you're loved by the great God of the universe, the, the, the God who is love, then that's in a way you'll be able to overcome almost every crisis. Um, and as coming back to Chief Lutuli's thing that you will ultimately find that freedom uh, will even be come through even the most difficult times, even through carrying uh, the, the cross, as it were, in, in Albert Lutuli's uh, words. The, uh, the, the, the church also, um, and, and I want to speak specifically about the church because that's the tradition I come from, and I can speak uh, best uh, in terms of that thing, is in terms of the COVID-19 response, um, it certainly has risen to the occasion in some parts. It, uh, the, the church's usual response to any crisis is threefold. The one is, is welfare intervention. The second is development intervention. And the third is prophetic intervention. And welfare intervention in COVID-19 has meant a lot of relief programs. And um, it, it has meant that it has rolled out you know, food parcels to people who are in need. Uh, it has uh, instituted sort of food vouchers, got very creative. And one finds that, that wealth intervention is probably the path of least resistance to, to showing love to one's, to one's neighbor. But welfare intervention on its own uh, is, is dangerous. Um, there, there can be what is known as toxic charity. Um, it is when you just create dependency or in a sense, you, you just see the other as a, an object of giving or an object of pity that you must give to, but you never really ask why that person is hungry or why that person is in those circumstances. And sometimes even some charitable acts can, be, can actually erode people's dignity. And I think that that's one of the things that we need to be very aware of. I often asked, uh, certain feeding schemes within our, our church environment. I say to them, how long have you been running this feeding scheme? They say, oh, and they say with great joy for 20 years. And I say, that is sad that, that you've been feeding hungry, uh, people for 20 years and you've never asked why they are hungry. Their circumstances haven't changed in 20 years. So I think welfare intervention has its place. Um, certainly people need to eat today 
And if people are starving and in, 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 a, in, a, in a time of crisis like COVID-19, we realize just how vulnerable people really are. If nothing else, that's what each of the pandemics that I've quoted has, has highlighted just how vulnerable and also how an equal society is. And that, um, again, you know, the rollout of vaccines, where does it start? It starts with the privileged. And we've just seen that happen now. And so these become questions that, that we then need to look at the next aspect of development. How do people begin to, to support themselves? And that's a, a question of development. How do we get alongside people? And I, I, I'm not a great fan of the word empowerment because I think empowerment is also a bit condescending. It's like, I have power and I'm going to empower you. I think uh, that we need to find another term of how we get alongside people who in a sense are, are deprived. And I think it's about uh, uh, giving people opportunity to be able to, 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 to rise out of their, their conditions as it were. But I think development is, is a very important aspect of, of the work that the churches embark on. But what we've often found, and with my long, uh, with my work with Diaconia Council of Churches for many years, we had what was known as an economic empowerment program. And we worked with, uh, with people who, in a sense, were unemployed and needed, uh, needed some kind of employment. And so we, we said, well, it would be good if they started up their own small business. And when we began to embark on that developmental program, we began to realize that there are huge obstacles in the way. Uh, obstacles like how do they find microfinance to, to, to start up a small business? And then we realized, then we moved on to the third aspect, which is, which is the prophetic, where you begin to ask, why are people hungry? Why are people unemployed? And that's the most uncomfortable place to be in. And that's when, um, when you begin to, to, to see that it's the very policies of, of, uh, or the very world that we're living, economic policies, uh, political policies that in a sense mitigate against the poor and uh, mitigate and, and create the crises. And uh, if, if anything else, the COVID-19 uh, has highlighted the socioeconomic inequalities in our country and, it, and may even have exacerbated because of the collapse of some of the economy. So we need to, to have those three approaches to a crisis. We need the welfare, where indeed people need to be fed today, but we cannot just continue with welfare as an end in itself. Development, where we need to, to, to see people begin to grow their own food, become self-sustainable, but we also realize that there's a lot of forces mitigating against their own upliftment and development. And that's why I think in the realm of the prophetic, where we begin to ask the uncomfortable questions, and also the prophetic also means to reimagine. And I think that was alluded to uh, by both previous speakers. We need to reimagine a new world, that a new world is possible. And our presiding bishop, uh, Reverend Purity Malinga, at the last conference, her theme was, how do we reimagine healing and transformation? because we have been on this journey of transformation for I don't know how long, but the poor are still poor, and this pandemic has just highlighted the inequalities in, in access to health, and how do we reimagine? And COVID-19 should push us, accelerate our reimagining to a new world that is possible. And so just to, to conclude, to say that at the heart of it all is that what drives us, what pushes us is compassion and the fact that God is love and that God loves the whole cosmos, everybody included in it, creatures and, 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 and humans alike. And so thank you so much for this, this, this opportunity just to share a couple of these, these, these few thoughts um, on this situation uh, around faith in crisis. Uh, thank you, Haley. Back to you. Thank you so much, Bishop Mike. That was really inspiring. And thank you for reminding us not to be in fear, to cast out fear, and to be inspired to love ourselves and to remind ourselves how loved we are by, by God and by others, and to um, exercise wisdom, obviously, um, as we go about being um, in this pandemic. But with that imagination, we can truly come out the other side of this valley stronger, wiser, 
and hopefully more connected. So thank you again for those beautiful, beautiful thoughts. Uh, dear friends, uh, we're going to now, before we start a discussion, I would like to invite a few friends to offer a few more prayers. Um, I have with us Mama Grace Fudu from Port Elizabeth, um, who I've asked to please offer a prayer for us. And then after uh, Mama Fudu, um, um, Sheikh Salim, and then we have a little treat after that. Mama Fudu, over to you. Hello. This prayer is for unity. Oh my God, oh my God. Verily I invoke thee and supplicate before thy threshold asking thee that all thy mercies may descend upon these souls, specialize them for thy favor and thy truth. O oh Lord, unite and bind together the hearts, join in accord all the souls, and exhilarate the spirits through the signs of thy sanctity and oneness. O oh Lord, Make these faces radiant to the light of thy oneness. Strengthen the loins of thy servants in the service of thy kingdom. O Lord, thou possessor of infinite mercy. O Lord of forgiveness and pardon. Forgive our sins. Pardon our shortcomings and cause us to turn to the kingdom of thy clemency. Invoking the kingdom of might and power. Humble at thy shrine and submissive before the glory of thine evidences. In a picture. Thank you, Mama Fudu. Um, we have A.K. Mohammed for us. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you for joining us, Ike Mohammed. Uh, we are very much looking forward to your praise song from the Muslim tradition. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, oh Allah, please show me the way so I go not astray. Edina Sirat al Mustaqim. Oh Allah, please show me the way. So I go not astray and be by my side. Oh, where we turn? There's always something for us to learn. Oh Allah, in your creation. Oh Allah, please show me the way. Mm -hmm. Oh Allah, please show me the way. So I go not astray. Edina Sirat al Mustaqim. O oh Allah, please show me the way so I go not astray and be by my side. Oh, we have to realize that we can't compromise. O oh Allah, between the right and wrong. O oh Allah, please show me the way. Mm. Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Fatah, Ya Aziz, Ya Muhyid, Ya Qawil, Ya Ghafar, Ya Khir. Mm. La 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 na 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 na. Allah, please show me the way so I go not astray. Edina Sirat al Mustaqim. 
Oh Allah, please show me the way so I go not astray and be by my side. Oh, wherever we turn, there's always something for us to learn. Oh Allah, your creation. Oh Allah, please show me the way. Oh Allah, please show me the way. Oh Allah, please show me the way. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. And we know Allah is the Arabic word for God, our, all of our creator. And I think we all need God's assistance to show us the way through this difficult time. Dear friends, we are going to now uh, move into um, a discussion period for a few minutes, just to give the, the friends that have joined us today um, an opportunity to share any of their thoughts. Um, I'm going to just put up some guiding questions. <clears throat> 